Um, welcome to our first National Academy of Construction Ask Me Anything for our spring 2021 semester. My name is Keith Molinar. I'm an NAC member and I'm a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Again, welcome. I hope you enjoy the session tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the National Academy of Construction. Um, it was established to recognize our industry leaders and an important purpose of the Academy is to provide a network system of a linkage between our past and our present participants in the construction industry. So as such, we've established this NAC AMA to help transfer knowledge to our next generation of construction leaders. So that's you, thank you again for joining us. The format for our AMA is simple. Our speakers make a short presentation about a topic and provide their perspective on the industry. Um, if you haven't already, please do email your questions to NACAMA, that's NACAMA at colorado.edu. I'll read those questions. And from the list of um, people who've submitted questions, one student or one participant here will win a $500 scholarship and we'll announce that at the end of the event. So please stay on and um, find out who won uh, the $500 scholarship. So it's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Stuart D. Anderson um, is a recently retired professor and holder of the Zachary Chair in Construction Integration from Texas A&M University. He holds a bachelor's degree in building construction from the University of Washington, a master's of civil engineering from the University of Illinois, and he received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I've worked with him for many years and just really lucky to have him with us tonight. Uh, previous to his academic career, um, he was with Floor Corporation for just under 12 years and also with Stone and Webster for two years, some very large engineering and construction firms. Uh, at the end of his career, he got a chance to work on um, in an owner's role, and he worked as, uh, for facilities oversight for the College of Engineering at Texas A&M on some very exciting new uh, engineering buildings. Maybe we can get him to share a little bit about that after his presentation. So prior to retiring, he was an active teacher and researcher with applications to industrial and heavy civil projects. He's published over 150 papers and technical reports. Um, he's still remaining active with the Transportation Research Board and the National Academy of Construction. Uh, with the NAC, he's involved in the Membership and Communications Committee and works on the Executive Insights, which uh, you'll see the one that he wrote there with the link to our invitation tonight, and that's what he'll be talking with. Um, among as many awards are two from ASCE, uh, that's the American Society of Civil Engineers, as well as the Zachary Teaching Excellence Award from Texas A&M University, and he also won the Outstanding Researcher Award from the Construction Industry Institute, our premier research institute in the construction industry. Um, Stu is uh, married to Debbie, and they've been married since 1975. They have two daughters, He's very involved in his church and volunteer work, enjoying traveling as he can, and um, uh, attending um, a and events when, when, when able. So I know uh, he's spending a lot of time with his grandchildren right now, but uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. So I wanna turn it over uh, to you to get going and I'll share the uh, slide presentation when you're ready. Hey, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so it's, of course, my pleasure to participate in this Ask Me Anything series based on project cost estimating. I will use a table from one of my uh, executive insights um, that summarizes cost estimating over the project development uh, process. Okay, Keith, go ahead. First slide okay. or second slide. All right. Give me one second. There we go. Okay, so uh, th this slide uh, captures project phase, type, purpose, basis, and, and comment. And we'll start with what's called front end planning and feasibility. Feasibility uh, phase evaluates whether or not a need or idea justifies a project. So in feasibility, there's very little scope definition and perhaps only a single facility parameter such as uh, building square foot or uh, megawatts for produced for a power plant. 
So the type of estimating is estimate type is called order of magnitude, which means we're trying to estimate 10 million, 50 million, or 100 million. Uh, the purpose is really to screen a project for viability. Does it meet benefit to cost uh, requirements or the rate of return on the investment? And the basis is typically dollar per uh, key facility parameter. And then now there's uh, th that parameter is tied to the type of facility, so it varies. And it also has to cover all costs. So uh, you have a complete estimate. But typically, you have to adjust for time if, uh, of, of, uh, and, and when the project's going to be done in time and what the location is. This is an owner driven uh, uh, phase. So uh, contractors typically don't get too involved. Next. So the next phase is called the concept phase. Uh, concept evaluates alternative solution if a project is justified in the feasibility phase. And this includes the types of technologies that may be involved if it's if technologies are involved, major construction uh, methods, construction materials, and locations. So the idea here is to select the best alternative and location. So the estimating type, you're still early, so you don't have a lot of information. So we still use this order of magnitude approach, perhaps on some of it in what's called factored or ratio or percentage estimating. So you have to uh, develop more detailed scope to be able to use these techniques. Again, the purpose here is to evaluate project alternatives and then ultimately select the best alternative among uh, uh, perhaps a number of alternatives using dollars per key facility parameter or some other method of uh, estimating uh, facility components and also adjusting always for location and time. This is a typically still an owner-driven uh, uh, activity, but service providers often support service providers being engineering or architects or others, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, Keith. So the last phase of front-end planning is called the detailed scope. Yeah, they actually, a contractor or an owner will actually commence engineering on the best alternative that was selected uh, in the previous phase to further to, to develop the scope to a sufficient detail so that a decision can be made on whether to move forward with the project or not. So the idea here is you de develop more scope, you define the basis, do some engineering, uh, you're still probably using factor to ratio percentages to determine major components of the facility. And the idea is to uh, get to a point where the owner can approve the best alternative to go to project execution. So now you really define major uh, facility parameters and some details of other parts of the project. For example, like major equipment, mechanical, electrical, and major quantities of bulk materials like piping or concrete. So it's still an owner-driven facility, but many times the service provider does a lot more work in this phase than, than uh, the previous other two phases. Okay, Keith. So once you've picked a project for execution, then you move into project execution where you do engineering design and procure equipment and materials. Uh, the detailed design de develops approved plans and specifications for construction. You begin the procurement process for buying selected uh, major facility equipment uh, and, and some large quantities of bulk materials. The estimate type is sometimes called semi-detailed. In other words, you have enough uh, you have to get enough quantity or, or, or enough preliminary uh, design information that you can actually put some details to develop a, a, a cost estimate that becomes the basis for cost and scheduling control. In other words, managing the project from here on out. So a combination of factored ratio is used, uh, what I call quantity pricing. So you have preliminary plans and specs so you could develop 
quantities for some things, some some uh, parts of the estimate and or the project, and then uh, uh, you could develop your total estimate. Again, this is, but this is kind of a change. This is driven by the service provider with owner uh, input. Okay, Keith. So the last phase is construction and project execution. Um, construction, of course, is installing all the equipment and materials, the permanent plan equipment and materials. Uh, the estimating type is called detail. Uh, it's the type of estimate that contractors do when bidding a project. So you have detailed quantities of everything, all parts of the project. Uh, so you could price those and the detailed quantities are based on 100% plans and specifications. So this, of course, is driven entirely by the service provider and most often the construction contractor who's bidding on it. Okay, before we move to questions, let me uh, just make a few uh, summary comments about estimating that you see in the estimating process you see in this chart. First of all, the purpose of estimating is to make financial decisions and to ensure there's sufficient funds available to pay for the project. Uh, determining a baseline cost for managing the project, we talked a little bit about that. For bidding the project, we talked about that. And for controlling costs as funds are expended uh, as the project moves forward. So there's a number of uh, people involved, uh, developers and users of estimates. Uh, typically, the main ones are owners, architects, engineers, general contractors and subcontractors, material and equipment suppliers. Their involvement varies depending on the project development phase and the type of project delivery and contracting approach. Uh, there's other people that are involved, but the ones I mentioned are the major players. So project cost estimating has some major challenges that we need to be aware of. Uh, number one, identifying project solutions are difficult to define. So when you're early in a project, it's really difficult to determine what it is you're gonna to try to design and build. So quantifying major areas of variability and uncertainty is difficult. This is the whole issue of risk analysis and, and, and the potential for overrun of project costs. Evaluating the completeness and quality of estimates is difficult. Again, this is more difficult early in the project and less difficult when you have 100% plans and specifications, but still difficult even at that stage. And then finally, tracking the cost impact of uh, scope development as you go from feasibility to concept to detailed scope in the engineering and design and finally construction. Changes happen and those changes have to be uh, costed so you can, the owner can decide whether they want to actually do those changes or not. So, so that, so in summary, let me just say four things here. Project cost estimating is a critical process in the development of a project. All project uh, participants develop and use cost estimates and project estimates are developed and refined as the project scope is developed over time and finally project cost estimating is a challenge. So that's it Keith, let's open it up for questions. Great, thank you Stu, I really appreciate it. Hey, as I uh, look up the questions here, um, I want to ask you one my, myself. Um, okay. I really, my favorite thing about being an estimator and I've spent a lot of time estimating is just how quickly you get to know the full project. I feel like yes. after doing an estimate, I've built the project virtually in my head and um, really enjoyed that. What, what's been your most enjoyable part about um, being an estimator? I know you've estimated for contractors and you've estimated for owners. What, what, what's been your most interesting? Well, I've always liked the early estimating, uh, trying to conceptualize a project with limited scope and then trying to determine what the cost would be that actually represents that project completely. And, and, and I guess I like that because it's really challenging. And, and to be honest with you, I like it because it's hard to argue with whether you're right or wrong. But when you do that, you got to put a sufficient amount of money in the estimate 
the conceptual estimate for uh, risk and variability and those kinds of things. Because there are, you, you're going to have things you're just not going to know of at the time you're doing that kind of estimate. So those, that early estimating was always sort of my favorite uh, uh, estimating to be involved in both in industry and over here at A&M. Great. Great. Well, we have a lot of questions about feasibility and early estimating, so I'll get to those. But I'm okay. going to start with, with one from uh, Thomas, which is around skills. Um, so if a student wanted to do cost estimation when getting out of college, what are some of the basic things or steps that they can improve so that their chances of getting that kind of job are better? So what skills should they be working on while they're in school to get a job as an estimator? Well, take an estimating course. For starters, you know, and a course that teaches you a little bit of everything, but maybe uh, you end up focusing on, uh, 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 you know, the the construction bid type estimate. Um, and I think what was valuable in my my mind was sort of the process that when I taught project cost estimating to seniors, the process that you go through, and, and I used to tell this tell these folks that, you know, every company is going to have their own basic approach to estimating. What I try to teach is just fundamentals that uh, they could use and apply in that, that situation. So uh, the one thing would be great if you could do it is get some practical experience. Yeah. Uh, doing summer jobs and, and, and it doesn't have to be practical experience doing estimating, just practical experience working on a design or construction project or something like that, because you really have to work at formulating what a project looks like in your mind if you don't have project uh, practical experience. The more practical experience, of course, you get the better you get at a uh, form of, you know, picturing the project in your mind. So you got to start somewhere. So I would try to get that practical experience and Make sure you take an estimating class that talks about hopefully all phases of uh, project estimating, not just the construction bid type estimating. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I, and I, I heard one thing in there too I would emphasize, and that's being able to visualize projects or being able to read plans, I think is really, really yep. important. So that plan reading, any yep. chance you can get in your classes is, is very important. Yeah. Good. Definitely. Well, um, Melanie asks a question, um, and since you've had uh, experience in both public and private uh, sector, um, she wants to know, are there differences in estimating a project depending if it's public or private sector? Yeah. I think the process is the same. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, 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 I'm not sure there is that much different. The types of projects are different, you know, there's, and so you have to have a different background if you're estimating a highway project for a DOT versus, a, a, you know, a building project for a private uh, company. But I, I, again, I think the process is just universal. And so what you got to do is learn uh, the background behind the industry, uh, if you're going to go into that uh, that area, so uh, I don't know if there's any real significant differences. I think some of the private companies, if owner companies, especially in the oil gas industry, to be honest with you, are far more sophisticated about their understanding of cost of estimating than perhaps you know some of the folks that are in the you know the public sector. Uh, that, that that I may not be fair in that uh, assessment, Keith, but that's that's sort of a perception I've had. I mean, I've met some really good estimators in the uh, uh, in the public sector as well. But uh, boy, the, the 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 oil and gas folks they know what they're doing when it comes to estimating. Well, those those projects, if they don't estimate them correctly, they don't make money, right? Um, and that's right, right. That's yeah, and that's yeah, that's that's a big difference. That's a good point, you know. In, in the private sector, you know, the owner is is looking for something that gives them a product that's going to make them money, and 
and, and in the public sector, you're trying to fulfill a need, for example, reduce congestion on a highway or something like that. So it's, it's a little bit harder to define the benefit, I think, in, in, in quantitatively in the, uh, in the uh, public sector than it is in the private uh, sector. Great, thank, thank you. Um, both uh, Grace and Kira are asking questions about how delivery methods relate to cost estimating. Um, I think, could, could you, and not, I'm not sure that everybody knows the you know, general delivery methods um, like design build versus design bid build or construction manager at risk. Could you just talk a little bit about how cost estimating varies across the different delivery methods? Yeah, give me a second. I got some notes on that. I, I thought about that, and and, and uh, I wanted to include that, but then decided uh, I wouldn't, that would be too much in a presentation. I guess I was hoping someone would ask something about it. So, so I use the words project delivery and contracting method. Okay, so project delivery means how the owner, contractor, designer uh, interface to deliver a project. Uh, contracting method means whether the, the, the contractual relationship is lump sum or, uh, or uh, uh, cost plus reimbursable, that sort of thing. So the basic the delivery approaches, at least in my mind, are design bid built. Okay, so design the project to 100%, bid it, the contractor bids on the project with 100% plans and, and uh, specs and then builds the project if they're selected as the low bidder. Typically it's a lump fixed price contract and they do that. Uh, then the second method is design build where there's a single contractor who uh, uh, proposes on the design and also building the project. And there's a lot of ways that can be configured. Uh, it could be lump sum, fixed price. It could be cost reimbursable. I think that sort of depends on what industry you're in. For example, the industrial design and construction industry tends to be more cost reimbursable when they do design build kinds of things as opposed to maybe the highway or the you know the building industry tends to perhaps do more design build on a fixed price basis so it's really up to the owner it, a lot has to do with the complexity of the project and which way they decide to go and that sort of thing and then the third major sort of delivery approach is what's called construction manager at risk uh, that's where the owner hires a con an architect and separately hires a, uh, a contractor and, and, or a, and also may hire a construction manager to manage the, the interface between the, uh, the uh, contractor and the architect. And that's been very popular and has become one of the, one of the, more used, newer, I guess I would say, uh, delivery approaches. Now they can do that on a fee uh, for the architect, which is normally done for architectural services. With the contractor, they can do it on a fixed price basis or they can start out on a reimbursable basis. And then at some point when the definition of the project's better defined via plans and specs, they can convert to a lump sum. Uh, the construction manager can manage the whole project or and, and the specific details of management may be done by a general contractor under uh, the, the uh, management of a, uh, a construction manager. So those are the three main ways that projects are delivered and, and contracted. There's lots and lots of different ways you can do that. How does estimating vary? with those uh, ways. Uh, well, in the design bid build, the designer does the early estimates, typically uh, sort of the way I described 
you know, by de uh, describing major categories of work and, and, and uh, pricing those. The contractor, of course, has drawings, so they do detailed quantity takeoffs and price those. Design build, that's going to be up to the uh, designer and contractor to figure out how they, they do the e estimating. Uh, in the highway industry, the, 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 the contractor usually takes the lead in, in design build. Interesting enough, though, in the industrial design and construction industry, there are companies like Fleur that do design and construction. So they can do everything themselves and, and they can typically do it under a number of different contracting strategies. And so the estimating processes aren't that much different. It just, you know, depends on the level of detail and when you have to produce the estimate that's going to be used to, you know, award the project or that sort of thing. Same thing with the construction manager at risk. So the, the, basically the estimating process is not all that different. It's just the type of facility might uh, influence that. The other thing I haven't mentioned is the database. Where do you get your data for estimating? And that's gonna vary depending on the project and, and, and the industry you're in and that sort of thing. Some, some industries are more sophisticated in terms of having databases of project costs that they can use for various types of estimates. Others are perhaps not quite as uh, sophisticated in that realm. I don't know if that, did that work? Yeah, <laughs> no, excellent answer. Yeah, thanks, uh, Grace and Kira for the, the question. Um, you know, kind of relating to database, um, you know, that gives you kind of historic um, uh, pricing and uh, productivity. Julio's asking about, um, how do general contractors or owners look at craft labor productivity? So how do, how do you adjust for variances in productivity from estimate to estimate? Well, it, you know, first of all, it's going to depend on the location of the project. And if you, if you do projects in the same general location, your database is okay. It's when you start moving out of that location, and you might be concerned of whether your database is appropriate or not. If it's not appropriate, then you're going to have to make some adjustment. You're going to have to go to that location and find out about labor productivity and how it compares to where you normally work. And if the productivity is better in that location, maybe you have a, a tighter estimate. If it's not as good, maybe you have to put more money into the estimate. So the key thing in my mind, and let just uh, let me give you an example from Fleur. Fleur developed all their estimates based on what they called a quote U.S. Gulf Coast location, because they did projects all over the United States and worldwide. So how do you adjust a project in the U.S. to some location like South Africa, for where I worked for several years? Well, you have to have a standard to work from a standard location to work from. And then you have to, like labor productivity, what we did is we went to South Africa and tried to figure out how they do construction in South Africa. What are the crews and how are they made up and how productive are they doing certain things so we could get some comparison to adjust our location-related estimate in the Gulf Coast area to a South African location. Great, uh, yeah, outstanding answer. Um, let me ask, I think Nicholas asked a good question that's related. Um, it's kind of a long one, so I'll say it and kind of he's, he gives a summary at the end, I think is really good. So uh, should a cost estimator put together an exhausting report that breaks down every man hour and foot of material, or is it more efficient to make a general estimate and minor changes from there as you go forward? Um, in brief, how much time should someone spend when creating a cost estimate for a project? Mm. <laughs> That's an interesting one. Well, I'll tell you that the, you know the uh, if they're doing a, a, a excuse me, telling me it's six thirty and all's well here. <laughs> if you're doing a cost estimate, let me let me get my excuse me. I got to get my frame of mind back here. Re repeat it quickly, Keith. Yeah, yeah. So. 
How much time should someone spend when creating a cost estimate for a project, that, that level of effort? Well, it, I guess it depends. If you go back to that table, it depends on where you are in that table. If you're a contractor bidding construction, uh, you go to every nut and bolt to make sure you got it covered. Because if you don't, it's going to come out of your profit if you have to pay for something that's not you don't have in your estimate. So it really depends where you're on that hierarchy from feasibility to, to, to construction. Uh, obviously, on the top end of that table, the time you spend isn't as much as the down at the bottom end when you're bidding for, for work. And, and you know, I, I know uh, one of the companies I've had some involvement with in Texas is Williams Brothers. Uh, you know, they're a huge highway contractors. And boy, when they put together an estimate, they go to every nut and bolt that's going to be on that project as, as best they can. Of course, they're bidding a project, so they're constrained somewhat by the time they have to bid the project after they get the plans and specifications. You know, and that's a resource issue. How many estimators do you have and how many can you put on that particular project, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it takes, you know, the more you get down that table, the more effort and energy it's going to take to put together estimates. Yeah, great, great. I think, um, you know, one way I've looked at it, uh, Stu, is the, the level of efforts um, directly correlated to the importance of the decision being made from the estimate, yep. right? Yep. Feasibility estimates support design or, um, you know, different aspects of how you're going to manage the project and cost estimating is a part of every day project management, but really yep. Yep. those big decisions, bidding a project, well, funding a project. You're always looking at benefit versus cost or rate of return, you know, one or the other. And if it's, if your benefit to cost is one or less, you don't want to do it. You know, if the rate of return doesn't hit your target, whatever that is, 10, 15 percent, you're not going to do the project. You're going to bag it. If you find out that, find that out earlier than later, that's better because the earlier you work, the early efforts on project uh, development and estimating, you don't spend as many, many hours doing things. So, sure, sure. Well, great. Thank you. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions in here about what happens when you miss an estimate or an estimate goes wrong. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me ask one from Dave here. Um, okay. What are the consequences? What, what consequences does an estimator face if the cost is very different from the actual? You know, um, do you have any extreme examples? Um, I, I know you do. Um, maybe, maybe you'd even want to talk a little bit about the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge or some of the other. Oh places. yeah, that's yeah. true. I, yeah. I've, I, Keith was talking about a project that he and I and some others were involved in where they just missed the estimate on this new bridge out there that had, you know, the first of a kind, self, what is it, self-anchored suspension bridge. It hadn't been built in the U.S. And so uh, it, it required an enormous uh, bracing and support structure underneath it until the guys and the cable were strong and that sort of thing. And uh, we got in it because they missed the estimate, I think, Keith, was the yeah. problem. And they were trying to, Caltrans was trying to figure out what happened. And so the consequences means that project was delayed. It finally got built after a long time, but there was a lot of struggle and effort to convince people that, you know, it was worth the uh, expenditure to, to do that. Um, you know, and another example I always like to use, it's not always uh, the overrun that causes problems. If you uh, come up with an estimate and it's way under what the board, uh, uh, the board approved, they're not happy campers either in that case because you're putting, they've tied up money that doesn't get used. And if you're way under, then there's a chunk of money that could have been used for another project. So the point is, it works both ways. You know, when they have to cough up more money because you overrun the, uh, the budget or the, the amount of money that's been allocated to the project, certainly that people aren't going to be happy with that, it's, especially if it's an overrun. If you're changing the scope and adding something that adds value to the project, that's a different story. 
unfortunately, there's a lot of times when things get left out of estimates and that sort of thing, which cause overruns. And management's never happy about that kind of uh, thing. Great. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of questions about um, contingency and, and how do you um, estimate contingency. So yeah, Thomas asked one about that. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about um, how you estimate those things that aren't on the plans yet or um, events or risks that, that might happen? Um, and maybe first by start by explaining what is a contingency and then how might one develop a contingency? Well, contingency is a, a, what I call, it's a cost category. It's not just fluff that the project manager puts in an estimate to cover cover their tail end. So, so there's gotta be a basis for it because you try to manage contingency. You wanna manage contingency. Uh, you wanna, you're probably gonna use it because your contingency covers uncertainties in your estimate, things you don't know, and you don't always know whether they're going to happen or not. So um, it's, a, it's a viable category. You, you don't want a project manager that thinks it's a slush fund that's going to save them from overrun. You want to try to define what's in contingency, and one way to do that is, you know, uh, Keith is through a risk analysis. Identify what the major risks are, and then estimate the, the cost of that risk, and then sort of look at it, what's the probability that that risk is going to happen, so you can put in at least some money to cover that probability. Um, so you got to define what that uh, risk is in a way that you can actually put some money to it that you can ask, uh, ask, uh, estimate the uh, cost of that uh, that risk so you can include it in contingency and you may include contingency just to reduce the chance of un overrun you know that's another thing it's not always just because there's risks and that sort of thing as we know there's variability in, in cost estimates and, and they can go up or they can go down. And, and so I think at least my opinion is historically estimates go up more often than they go down. So one of the reasons you use contingency is because historically that's what happens. And so it's a little harder to justify that. That's why we use risk analysis, some sort of structured approach to uh, identifying risk and then uh, quantifying that risk into dollars so you can include it in in contingency with some some confidence that you really know what you have when I was the last project I was on I really didn't understand contingency I mean, we used the Monte Carlo simulation Keith but you know the 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 last project the guys wanted to use ten percent contingency. What the heck, you know, and, and with no basis for it, you know. And I learned later on that was a mistake because the project ended up overrunning big time, and there was huge problems. That was after I was gone, fortunately. <laughs> but you know, it, it's it, it it happened, and and it happened because there was the estimate was biased downward. It wasn't really a good projection. The contingency was just, oh, I think let's use 10% because that's an acceptable amount to our management. And one of the issues you always have is you got to convince someone that your contingency is actually realistic and needs to be part of your rest. Excellent answer. Yeah, great insights there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you two questions, um, one from Caleb and one from Brad. I'll, I'll start with Caleb's. Okay. Um, you really, you know, describe the life cycle and how estimating goes a across the life cycle. Um, Caleb's interested in the feasibility um, phase. Yep. Um, what type of documentation is required and how does one weigh whether a project is actually feasible or not? Good question. First of all, there's not a lot of documentation because you're typically, you know, not using, uh, you don't have much in the way of, uh, uh, scope developed when you're doing feasibility. So I see feasibility as really a screening activity to try to determine if you really want to go forward with a project. Uh, you, you, you know, if, it, if you find out that it's just 
you know, it does it returns five percent on your investment when you're looking for fifteen. You don't want to do that. You want to try, you know, something's wrong. So you either got to explore that project and try to determine what's going on or, or not. Because you're only working with a small number of parameters from a cost perspective. And so that, that's one of the difficulties. I would say even at that, at that level, you need to document what you did. What's your assumptions on uh, scope? What's your assumptions on the cost estimate basis? What's your assumptions on location and time and, and, and those kinds of things? Because to me, estimating is about documentation of what you did and why you did it. And that's, and you, and that's any feasibility or even when you're down in the weeds doing you know, construction estimates. You got to document what you did. Because the estimate may change and some management type's going to ask you, why did it change? Where's, what, what's different now than it was the last time you did the estimate? Yeah. yeah, you've talked a lot about that, the discipline of writing everything down, keeping those documentation throughout, right? It starts at yeah. and goes throughout. Well, and, and, and you know, and you, you're probably going to have someone reviewing your estimate and your management in a company. And so you got to be able to explain, you know, what what's in the estimate. How do you know you've covered everything and you haven't left something out? And that's especially tricky in the feasibility realm because you don't have that much scope. So it may depend on what you know, if, for example, if your historical basis for doing the estimates of similar project, not a database, but a the actual similar project that was built, designed and built somewhere, uh, that may be the best source of, uh, of data for estimating the new project. Of course, you got to adjust for differences between the scope of the two projects. There might be minor differences, and then the time frame the project was at, the actual project was built and and the location of that actual project. Great, right. yeah. Thanks. And you want to document all that. You got to document all that because, you know, I I one of the last projects I was on a floor I was in an, in my boss's office at 2, 2 a.m. night, we were talking about how to explain the differences in the <laughs> estimate at, 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 for a meeting at 8 in the morning. And so, uh, you know, we, you, you got to pay attention because managers ask funny things. You don't, they're, they ask things that you don't expect. So you got to be really prepared and understand your estimate. Yeah. Yeah. I, on the other side, you know, I've been in, in meetings where I felt I knew the project better than some of the project managers and even the designers because I'd you know, done the estimate on the complete project. Yeah. It's, it's the best yeah. way to learn a project. It really yeah. is. It sure um, is. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me get back to Brad's question here on the other end from the execution side. Um, what are some of the biggest hurdles for a contractor to overcome when estimating and bidding, um, especially from a new estimator's point of view? Oh, geez. Well, again, just getting that experience you know, I, I always told my students, SMAG is an experience-based, you know, activity. You got to have experience. If you don't have it, then you got to rely on other people to help you out. So always ask questions. If you're working and you're new and you're working on an estimate, ask ask someone that's, that's you know, done it, knows it, understands it, so to help you out because it's, you know, it's not... You gotta. It's it's important that you learn that kind of stuff, and you know I I don't think you're expected to know everything right out of the box. So you just you know you gotta produce, but you gotta be able to ask questions. I think and, and, and about uh, estimates, especially those other end of the execution. You know, when you're looking at plans and specifications, get as much of that as you can if, when you're in school. You know, even if you go pick up your own plans and specs from someone just to spend your own time looking at them, it's a good thing. You got to learn to understand and how to read those rascals. So, it, and it takes time. Great, great advice. Gosh, we have so many questions. Um, Francisco, uh, Zarina, Ryan, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to get to everybody's uh, questions. We have about five minutes left here. 
us do, or just a little bit more than that. So um, I'm gonna, we'll get through as many as we can and then wrap things up. But um, Abigail asks a good question um, about the pros and cons for working for a firm that has an estimating department versus someone that doesn't have a separating separate estimating department. Um, you could probably take that different ways. I know you see yeah. contractors and designers organize in different ways. Um, maybe from yeah. a, you know, someone graduating and going to work, what, what could they be looking for and what are some of the pros and cons to the different ways that people do estimates? Yeah, well, let me start by you know talking about Fleur. Fleur had an estimating group that that did mostly detailed type estimates. You know, when you had plans and specs, and most of the earlier estimates were done by individuals on projects that just learned how to do things. So, uh, um, you know, I think that varies some depending on the company and how they want to build. Uh, they're estimating staff. Uh, I, I don't know, but I, you know, I think some, you might find some companies where, you know, estimators, they can make a lot of money because of what they do. And so, uh, and they may not necessarily have an estimating department as she, as the question sort of implied. It may be just part of every job. Um, the pros and cons of having an estimating department is trying to develop some standards so that estimates are done in a similar fashion across companies or different parts of the company, depending on how big the company is, for example. Um, so you get some consistency in how you do estimates. I know that was always a problem for Fleur. Fleur is a big company, and so and they had divisions in Houston and, and across the U.S. And sometimes you, you wondered if you're talking to people in the same company. So consistency across the company standards and how to do estimates and that sort of thing is, is, is helpful. I don't know. What, what else? No, I think, you, I think that's an excellent answer. Um, let me ask um, one final one from Ryan, and then we'll start to wrap things up here. Um, he wants to know about life cycle costing um, and how that plays out in the design and um, uh, cost estimating process. So life cycle of materials and such. Yeah, well, the, uh, uh, I don't, I never really got into that too much in, in what I did, but you know, in, in, in one, I, I think it was used more often when looking at alternatives and trying to assess whether you know, this is a better alternative. A is a better alternative than B. Trying to accomplish the same things, but maybe in a different way. And so, and looking at the life cycle is important because maybe there's some benefits in A, life cycle wise, that aren't in B. And maybe the capital cost in B is lower than the capital cost in A, but the benefits in A are, up, you know, end up making it a better choice in the long run just based on life cycle costs so I it has a place I didn't do much of that in what I did when I worked for floor or as I worked for A&M here uh, and I didn't really teach it that often I did you know life cycle costs obviously cost estimates part of it because you have to estimate the cost and and that sort of thing but you know it also has something to do with the benefits that you're going to get over that life cycle. I don't know if that helps you helps him understand it better. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, there's that uh, definitely a trade off. Um, you know, with uh, cost of materials, sometimes uh, things that cost less don't last as long, require more maintenance, and um, you know when you can you make those estimates in the design and, and construction process and always try and understand the trade-offs between yeah. first costs and costs down the road, those types of As things. you know, in the highway industry, the, the, uh, uh, the, the discussion's always about asphalt versus concrete. Yeah. You know, and the concrete guys argue that it's more expensive up front, but it lasts longer with less maintenance. And the asphalt guys say, well, it's less expensive. And, I do, you do have to do some repairs over time, but it's still less expensive than, than, than the concrete thing, so. Great, well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have to, um, for 
participant questions here. I do want to watch everybody's time. So, um, with Dr. Anderson, I did want to give you a, a chance just to close it out with any final pieces of advice or any any thoughts after all those questions. Well, I guess it, if you, if you're really interested in cost estimating, it it you know it can be a, a very uh, uh, interesting career to get involved in. Uh, but again, I. I never was comfortable with it until I got field experience. And once I got field experience, then I felt better because I really could visualize uh, a facility better. So, and, and, you know, and it's, it's hard to visualize a f facility off of drawings, although nowadays you have 3D drawings and so you can look at a facility a little differently than perhaps what I did in the old days when they just had 2D drawings. But uh, I think under getting experience, I think is important. Estimating is a, a job that's always going to be there, and it's going to be there across a lot of different companies. And like I said in the after the slide presentation, that you know there's a lot of players that use and develop and use estimates, and so it's you know from a career perspective, it's a good field to get into. Uh, whether it's a good stepping stone to get up into management or not, I, that's, I'm not so sure about that exactly. But like I said, a good estimator can make a good salary. So you wouldn't be missing out, I don't think, from a salary perspective if you went that direction. Uh, again, I like the early estimating. Uh, I think somewhat because I it was hard to challenge you on you, what you came up with if you had a good basis for documenting and, and your historical data and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I didn't do a lot of detailed estimating, although I did some, you know, that, that was in the bidding sort of mode, but not as much. But it's a good field. It's worth getting involved in. And it can be a stepping stone to do other, other things. I think especially with contractors, if you're doing it in a contractor, setting. I was in an engineering and design and construction company. So, you know, it's a little bit different setting from, you know, in my experience base. But I liked it. I enjoyed doing it. So Excellent. I enjoyed teaching it too. Actually, that was a lot of teaching was a lot of fun. So, uh, you know. well, Stu, thank you for all of your insights and your time for preparation and just everything. Oh, you bet. It's been could. fun. Great questions, folks. Hey, I'm impressed. Really thinking good. about the right things, that's for sure. Thinking about the right things. Great. Well, I'm going to wrap us up and just remind people we're doing this the last uh, Tuesday of every month here through April. We have uh, Bob Prado is going to talk about uh, systemic risks and large projects. Uh, Chris Trailer is going to talk about um, pricing work in a joint venture. And then Cliff Shake Snyder will uh, wrap us up kind of on the, the um, project execution side with building unit price work. So I, I hope that you can hope that you can join us. I also really wanted to thank. Um, uh, well, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Please do uh, use the resources and the executive insights. Um, we've decided this spring to to look at executive insights. I hope you wrote the one or you read the one that Dr. Anderson wrote. There's a very short, um, you know. Uh, five page, five page plus or minus um, paper with each of these uh, discussions we're having. So I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, I did want to just uh, thank Dr. Anderson again, and also the National Academy of Construction, especially uh, Wayne Crew and Sandy Pittman there, and also um, at the University of Colorado, Jane Manalo for making all this happen um, behind the scenes. So thanks to everyone. Um, and then thanks to the NAC for the donations. Um, uh, to, to, for the scholarships for this and the other scholarship opportunities through NAC. Um, and that brings us to a close and I wanna announce the winner of our scholarship. And uh, today it's Serena Farmer-George from the University of District Columbia. So um, Serena, uh, Jane will be in touch with you via email and we'll um, get that scholarship uh, to you. So thank you Good everyone. Work. Good work to Sabrina. Uh, Sabrina, yep. is that it? Yeah. Serena, yeah. Serena, yep. Great. Yep. Great work, everyone, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in a month. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.